Welcome to everyone for tonight's class, which is on the heroes of Islam. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us in this series of lessons that are talking about those great individuals that caused this ummah to prosper and who we can benefit from their life histories <coughs> by learning about their great and noble characteristics. So first of all, why do we learn these biographies? As we always remind one another, <clears throat> our goal is not to enjoy and, and listen to entertaining stories. Our goal is to learn characteristics that are needed for the Ummah today. Because of course, today we wish that the Ummah return to its previous glory. And the only way that that, that can be achieved is if we inculcate and practice the characteristics of Islam. Those noble traits that our predecessors had. We need to learn them and practice them and inculcate them in our lives until they become part of our nature. And then in that way, these deep-rooted uh, characteristics and noble uh, qualities will become part of our lives. And on, in, only in that way we will achieve the success and happiness that our previous generations had. So tonight's lesson is about one of those great heroes. And he comes from the noble lineage of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name is Muhammad ibn Hussein. Muhammad ibn Hussein, who is the son of Ali, the son of Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. So Muhammad, uh, excuse me, Ali ibn Hussein. Ali ibn Hussein was also known as Zain al Abidin or the beauty of the worshippers. Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. So let's think about the lineage here. Abu Talib was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, right? He had the son Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali had two sons. Who were they? Who were the two sons of Ali radiallahu anhu? Ali and Fatima, right? You remember? So who were the two sons of Ali and Fatima? Hassan and Hussein, the two Sayyid Shabab and Jannah, the two noble inhabitants of Jannah, the Rayhanatain of the Prophet ﷺ, the two sweet-smelling uh, children of the Prophet ﷺ. So Ali, he had Hassan and Hussein. And then from Hussein, may Allah be pleased with him, he, Hussein had a son. And that son, his name was Ali. And Ali, that Ali, he was given the nickname, the laqab, Zain al Abidin, or the beauty of the worshippers. And this is because he used to be so devout, so pious in his worship of Allah. It was said that there was no better worshipper on the face of the earth. And Zuhri, one of the scholars amongst that generation, were, which are called the Tabi'een, he said, I have never seen somebody more pious more Zahid, more uh, away from the luxuries of this world and more away from the doubtful matters than Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn Hussein, Rahmatullahu alayhi. Zain al Abidin, he has his father is Hussein, and his mother was actually the daughter of the king of Persia. So you might wonder, how did Hussein have a wife who was the daughter of the king of Persia? Well, when the king of Persia was, when Persia was conquered by the Muslims, then the women that, that were with those mushrikeen, they were captured and taken as the slave women. And so the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, they married from those women, or they took from those women, and they had children from them. And so Hussein, radiallahu anhu, he married the daughter of the king of Persia. Her name was Sulafa. Sulafa. So he married her and he had 
from her this child Zain al Abidin. Zain al Abidin, he was the child of Sulafa and Hussein. And from Zain al Abidin's lineage, there is also many very, very righteous people that continue on that lineage. But we'll talk about them perhaps in the future, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Zain al Abidin, rahmatullah wa he was present in the, the battle of Karbala. You might have heard about Karbala when his Hussein was killed uh, in that unfortunate incident. However, his son uh, Ali ibn Hussein, Zain al Abidin, he managed to leave Karbala without being injured. He was sick, so he actually didn't go to the battlefield. But he witnessed his father and his family being killed. And he was taken to Yazid. Yazid was the ruler at that time, the Khalifa at that time. And Yazid honored him and sent him back to Medina. And he was patient during all of these ordeals. And this is something we're going to learn about Zain al Abidin's righteousness. That in spite of seeing his father and his family being killed, he kept patient and he remained obedient to the Khalifa of the Muslims. And of course, this is for a greater wisdom, uh, which we'll talk about inshallah ta'ala. So, uh, Zain al Abidin, he did not bear any grudges. And this shows you the purity of his heart. That even though uh, Abdullah ibn Ziyad, who was the commander of the army that killed his father, even though that took place, he did not bear any grudges towards Abdullah ibn Ziyad or to Yazid or the rulers at that time. He kept patient and he kept, uh, he didn't, you know, allow his, the anger to affect him. Um, Zuhri rahmatullah again he was one of the tabi'in he said I have never seen a Qurashi better than Ali ibn Hussein Ali ibn Hussein Zainal Abidin I've never seen a Qurashi in another narration he said I've never seen anybody from the family of the Prophet sallam better than him he was so devout in his worship and he kept obedience to the Khalifa the Khalifa was Marwan ibn al-Hakam and so what do we learn from this? Again, we're trying to learn these beautiful qualities. We learn not to hate. Not to hate. Even though the, the, the commander under the Khalifa, under Yazid, had just killed his father, who was Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, yet he did not become angry and curse the ruler, and he did not rebel against the ruler. He remained obedient to him, and he prayed behind the rulers of the Muslims. And this is the path to true happiness. In order for the Muslims to unite and, ha and have brotherhood and have unity, they have to sometimes close the door about bad things that happened in the past and get rid of the grudges, not to open the door of fitna again and cause hatred and fighting, but to close the door and forgive and not to bear grudges. Today you find that the, the Shia and the Sunnah, you find that they, the issues are being brought up again and again. And people are talking about what happened to Hussein and how he was killed. And then it incites the anger and it incites the division and the sedition. And then it, that leads to war and killing and massive killing. All of that because people are bearing grudges over something that happened thousand years ago more than a thousand years ago, but because of those grudges and, and the lack of, and the lack of, <laughs> we have a friend here, <laughs> because of those grudges, we don't let them go, and because of that, it opens the door of what? Fighting and hatred and fitna amongst the Muslims. So one thing we can learn, and this is a beautiful lesson from Zain al Abidin, who was from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that he taught us, he taught the Muslims to remain patient, even if you see evil that is being done. Sometimes we have to turn the page and close the door of fitna, so that the greater good can be established. Zain al Abidin, rahmatullah alayhi, he used to weep 
And he used to, when he stood up for prayer, they say that before he went to prayer, he used to make wudu, and his face would turn pale. He would turn like colorless, his face. And then when he stood up for prayer, he would be trembling, shaking. So they asked him, why are you trembling? What's wrong? And he said, do you know who I am going to stand in front of? Do you know who we are going to meet right now? So he used to, even just making wudu, he used to turn pale, thinking about the greatness of standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Dhahabi, Imam al-Dhahabi is, he's a biographer of the righteous people. He has a famous book called The Stories of the Noble People, Seer Alam al nubala Imam al-Dhahabi, who's a great historian, he said that there was no one greater than him in terms of respect and dignity. He had so much dignity and respect and ibadah. And in fact, he could have been the Khalifa. He had so much respect. And one of the interesting stories was that Hisham ibn al-Hakam, who was one of the rulers, and later on he became the Khalifa, he was at the Kaaba. And he was making tawaf around the Kaaba. And at that time, the Umayyads, they were based in Damascus, in Syria. So he, a lot of the Syrian people were there with him, and they were crowding him. And he couldn't really even get near the Kaaba or make tawaf. Hisham, the ruler, the political ruler. So they put like a pulpit for him to sit on. So he sat there and with him was his poet, Farazdaq. Farazdaq is a famous Arabic poet. So they sat on the pulpit and there was a big crowd and Hisham ibn al-Hakam couldn't make the tawaf near the Kaaba. Now Zayn al-Abideen, he came. And when he came, all the people opened the way and got out of his way to let him come close to the Kaaba and to make the tawaf and to touch the black stone out of respect for him, out of so much respect for this person who they loved and revered. And so Farazdaq, he wrote, he said some words of poetry at that time. I cannot really translate it well in English, but some of the things he said, is that this man whom all the people are getting out of the way so that he can make his tawaf when Hakam when uh, when Hisham ibn Hakam was just there and everybody was crushing him and Hisham became angry actually when he saw this he saw that all the people are making way for uh, Zayn al-Abidin but they didn't make way for him so he became angry so Farazdaq he said a poem he said a very nice poem and he said this man, Zayn al-Abideen, he is the best of the descendants of Rasulullah sallallahu The Kaaba and the black stone and the people know him from his excessive worship, from his extreme amount of worship. He's worshiping Allah so much that the, the people got to know him, that he's here to worship and they respected him. And the, as if the Kaaba and the black stone, they know him. As if they, uh, they know him. And they said that he has shyness. Farazdaq. He said that he has shyness and humility. But because of that, people respect him and honor him. And he called him the taqi an-naqi. The pure and the pious. And he said, Farazdaq, he said, whenever he speaks, he smiles. And... The black stone is familiar with his hand, from him touching the black stone so much. So Hisham ibn Hakam, the, the, the ruler, became very angry when he heard this poem. And he put Farazdaq, the poet, in jail outside of Mecca. <laughs> so uh, Zayn al Abidin, he heard about this. He said, This, po this poet was praising and saying good things about your worship, that you were worshiping Allah, and because of that, the ruler put him in jail. So, out of pity for him, Zayn al Abdin sent 12,000 dirhams of charity to Farazdaq. In that place in isolation, he sent him some charity. So, Farazdaq, when he received this charity, he refused. He said, I said those words not for any worldly gain. I wanted to do, say them for the sake of Allah. 
I was praising this person because of his closeness to Allah and I wanted to encourage that. So I didn't do it for any money. So he sent the money back to Zain al-Abideen. Zain al-Abideen received the money back and he said, send it back to him again and tell him Allah knows what your intention was. You didn't do it for the money, you did it for the sake of Allah, but take this charity. And so Farazdaq, he took the charity after that. So you see the, uh, the care of Zain al-Abideen for this poet who was wronged by the ruler. The people have all agreed on the honor of Zain al-Abideen. Rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah be pleased with him. Ali ibn Hussein. They agree that he is uh, one of the most honorable people in his character, in his nobility, in his dignity. And this is why it's important for us to, when today we don't find people who have this kind of shyness and humility. Right? Today do we find that most people are lacking in the, ch the generosity, the chivalry, the, the shyness, the humility that Zayn al-Abideen had. So it's good for us to read his story, to read about his piety, so that it will, inshallah, motivate us a little bit, somewhat to have that piety, to have that shyness, and have that devout, devoutness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Zayn al-Abideen, may Allah be pleased with him, he was very humble. As you heard earlier, that when his own father and family was killed, he did not rebel or get angry with the ruler, but he kept patient and he remained obedient to the Umayyad ruler. And something beautiful about him is that he used to love knowledge. And he used to sit with the slaves, the freed slaves. There was three very famous freed slaves in Medina. That they were the children of like we mentioned earlier that the, the Persian, when the Persian Empire was conquered, some of the Sahaba married the daughters of the Persian king. There were three great scholars from amongst those freed slaves. And Zayn al-Abidin would love to go and sit with them. Now imagine, Zayn al-Abidin used to be criticized. You are the great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the noblest of lineage. Not only are you from Quraysh, from Banu Hashim, you are literally coming right from the lamp, lantern of the prophethood. The most noble of people, and you're sitting, jumping over the people, trying to get close to the teacher who is teaching the knowledge in the masjid of the Prophet system, and he's a slave. So some people used to criticize him because they still had this mentality, which is from the Jahiliyyah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, something from the Jahiliyyah that will not go away is what? What is it? Asabiyyah. Asabiyyah. What is Asabiyyah? Tribalism, racism. So people used to see Zayn al-Abideen going and sitting with a free slave. They said, how can you sit? How can you go there and sit with a slave to learn? You're the, the great grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. So somebody one of the people of that time used to criticize him for that. And yet, Zayn al Abidin, what did he say? He said, I will go, or a man should go wherever he finds beneficial knowledge. SubhanAllah, look at his humility. He used to climb over the shoulders of people to come close to a slave, a freed slave, to get some beneficial knowledge. This is his humility and his piety. See, somebody who's really pious, he doesn't, he's not going to allow the criticism of people to prevent him from getting the beneficial knowledge. He wants, he knows the value of knowledge. And so he gives up that, uh, the pride or the praise of the people, and he humbles himself to come close to the teacher of the knowledge. And so this is also a problem that Zain al Abidin showed us through his example that two people that as the, the narration says two people will never attain to knowledge who are those two kinds of people the arrogant person and the shy person <laughs> the arrogant person he will not attain to knowledge because he refuses to go to the people of knowledge he thinks he knows everything why should i go and sit with somebody else i know everything 
And the sh or he says, why should I learn from so-and-so? I'm better than him. He's from a different tribe, a different race. He's from a slave. He used to be a slave and I'm from so-and-so lineage. So all of that is preventing the person from learning. And the, and the other example is the person who's too shy. If he's too shy, he is afraid to go and ask help, uh, ask questions. And he's afraid to go to the teacher in the first place. So this shyness prevents him from acquiring the knowledge of the religion. And so this, this was a, a, a negative quality of the jahiliya, they're called the fakhr, the khuyala, the kibr, the arrogance. And Zayn al Abidin did not have any of it, subhanAllah. This shows you the beautifulness of his character, subhanAllah. How beautiful that he is, could be considered, they said he could have been the Khalifa. This is what his contemporaries, they said he, he was deserved to be the Khalifa. He had so many good qualities, the knowledge, the piety, the taqwa. But in spite of that, he's sitting under the circle of a freed slave to learn knowledge. Can you imagine that? You know, somebody who can easily be the Khalifa with, in terms of knowledge, irrespective of his lineage. He had so much knowledge and piety, he deserved to be the Khalifa. And yet, in spite of that, he goes climbing over people to seek knowledge in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. They said due to his, he had so much humility, and this is the praiseworthy humility, that when he left Medina and he was riding a mule, he would never tell people, Tariq, Tariq. <laughs> it's mentioned in the books. He's laughing because the, the brother just came back from Umrah. Tariq, Tariq is what you hear non-stop. Right in the haram, in the in the in the places of of people walking, right? Tariq tariq means get get out of the way. I have a horse, I have a camel, I need to move, I need to get through. Usually they say with a wheelchair today, right? Tariq tariq. They're trying to push the wheelchair. They want you to move out of the way. He was so humble that even though when he was riding the the, the mule and maybe he's on a small road, he was on the road. Or he he wouldn't tell people get out of my way. He would say this pathway is shared between all of the people. So I have to share it with others. I can't say tariq, it's not my tariq. <laughs> this tariq belongs to everyone. So I have, I can use what Allah gives me or what I have a pathway for and I cannot force the other people out of my way. Look at this true, you know, this character, this nobility. This comes from a noble person. He doesn't feel arrogance towards others. He feels uh, this is what they call maru'a, chivalry, you know, dignity. Uh, he never used to hit a donkey. He never used to beat his donkey. You know, you're going on a journey, usually they say you have to beat that horse or the camel to make it run and go on the journey. He never used to beat his animal. And so we can learn this from him. After he put it directly into practice. Okay, now another quality of Zayn al-Abidin is his, again, we, we kind of talked about nobility or chivalry. You know what chivalry is? They translate chivalry that's called maru'a in Arabic. What is it? Can you tell me what is chivalry? What does it mean to you? Huh? Anything. What does chivalry mean to you? Kindness. Kindness. Very good, very brave, generous, right? It's a kind, they kind of call it manliness, right? It's a, it's a noble uh, characteristic of a person. We don't find it much today. Not many people have maru'a today. They don't have that. Mainly it's in generosity, karam, being good to the guest, honoring the guest, being uh, generous. But look at Zayn al-Abideen, rahmatullah wa One time, Muhammad ibn Osama, Muhammad ibn Osama, uh, you heard of uh, Zayd ibn al-Harith, right? Zayd ibn al-Harith, he was the adopted son of the Prophet system, right? You, everybody know who he is? Zayd, Zayd ibn al-Harith? Yes. In the beginning of Islam, even before Islam, Khadija gave Zayd as a gift to the Prophet system, as a wedding gift, right? Zayd ibn al-Harith, he's called the beloved of the Prophet system. Prophet Muhammad system used to carry him on his shoulders and walk around the Kaaba and say, this is my son, this is my son. This is before adoption was prohibited. He loved him so much, right? And remember when Zayd's father came? 
I, I, I will pay anything to free you. You don't have to be a slave anymore. Zaid, he said, I, you can, you're, I'm happy to see you, but I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I want to stay with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? So Zaid ibn Harith, he's called Muhib an Nabi Sallallahu the beloved of the Prophet Zaid had a son whose name was Osama. So Osama is called the, the beloved of the beloved of the Prophet he was the son of Zayd ibn al-Harith. So his name is Osama ibn Zayd. Now go one more generation. You have Muhammad. Muhammad was the son of Osama, who was the son of Zayd. Muhammad was dying. Muhammad ibn Osama was dying. And he was crying and wailing. So um, Zayn al-Abidin came to, to visit him and to see how he's doing and as he was dying. And he saw him wailing. And he said, what? It makes you cry. Why are you crying? And he said, I have a huge debt. I owe a massive amount, 10,000 dinar. A massive amount of money. And he didn't want to die with this amount of money on his neck. So immediately Zain al-Abidin says, it's upon me. I take its responsibility. Khalas, it's done. It's done. <laughs> immediately. He didn't ask him, who do you owe this money to? What is it for? Where did he get this debt from? How much is it? When am he said, it's on me. Khalas. Die if <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> he, this, is, this shows you. What does this show you? It just shows you a, the, what they call marua, Chivalry. Manliness. He didn't hesitate. He said he, he has that nature. And this is what we are lacking uh, in our interactions today. Because this kind of forgiveness, if we have this nature, the chivalry, it will get rid of a lot of our problems, a lot of our fighting with each other. We'll forgive. We will overlook the faults of others. Another example, this is a very touching example. Um, I hope the sisters are listening to this, inshallah. Uh, Zain al-Abidin, he had a son. He was a little baby, a little young boy. And so one of his servants was cooking uh, on a fire. And he had a very large metal with a meat on it and he he heated it up in the fire and it became very very hot extremely hot so that servant he was carrying that that burning metal with the meat on it and he fell and he dropped the skewer the, with the big meat on it the metal onto the son of Zain al-Abidin and the little boy got killed from that burning that that fell on him no 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 he, he did it accidentally he tripped. He, he was trying to bring the food and it was very, very hot from the fire. And he slipped and the, the, the burning food and the burning metal fell on the little baby, the child of Zain al-Abidin, and he kill, it killed the boy. The child of Zain al-Abidin. So what did Zain al-Abidin do? He get angry. Why did you kill my child? And punish him and whip him and beat him. Right away, because he knew how the slave is going to feel. He must be fearing for his life. <laughs> right? The slave is thinking, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be executed. I killed a, a child who's a grand the, from the lineage of the Prophet. I might be in big trouble. Immediately he told him, La alik. It's not your fault. You didn't intend it. You are free for the sake of Allah. Immediately he told him that. And I, I have personally witnessed, personally, I have witnessed this type of marua, this type of generosity and nobility. Uh, a friend of mine was driving in Syria. And Syria still has very many righteous people, especially in the Ghuta. The Ghuta is the countryside of Damascus, the farming areas. So he said he was driving. This is a Western person. He had drove a car. And he said he was driving on a road and suddenly a child ran in front of him. And he hit the child and the child perished, was killed. So this was in a, in a country road, and he looked, the family was nearby from the farm, and they came out, and they said, what happened? Our child has been killed. They took the child, they put him on the side, and they called the, the police, and they waited for a long time for the police to come and, and to take the report and everything. The family invited the driver of that car and his family into the house. And they gave them and they served them drinks and, and food while they waited for the police. The family of the child who was killed. 
Can you imagine that? Your child has just been killed by somebody driving on the road. And now th those people, because they're strangers in a strange land, and they're foreigners, and you are a generous person, you take care of them, and you say, come to my house, sit down, I will, let me give you some water, let me give you some food. This is the kind of nobility that our predecessors had. SubhanAllah, can you imagine that, that, uh, that uh, honoring the guest, that feeling of honoring the guest, even though such a person had just killed their child. This is exactly what Zain al-Abideen, may Allah be pleased with him, he taught us. Uh, another time, one of the servants, he was being, he was being uh, reprimanded. So he, Zain al-Abideen had went to get the, the whip to punish the servant. But then as he went, he said he remembered the ayah, قُلْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَغْفِرُوا Say to those who believe, forgive. So then he told the servant, he said, I remember this ayah, so I'm going to forgive you. The servant said, I don't deserve to be forgiven. This is for the people who are very righteous. I did, did something wrong. So Zayn al Abidin, he appreciated his statement and he let him go. He said, he, he acknowledged, acknowledged that he had done something wrong. And because of that, he freed him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another time, Zayn al Abidin was walking in the street and somebody cursed him. Perhaps the person didn't know who this was, or perhaps he just became angry. So he cursed Zain al-Abidin. So Zain al-Abidin, he had totally ignored him. He didn't respond, he just looked away. So the person, he said, I meant you. And so Zain al-Abidin, he said, yes, and I ignored you. <laughs> he said, I, no, I heard, and he knew what he was saying, but he said, I, I meant to ignore you. I don't want to respond with what you are saying. SubhanAllah. And he was, uh, of course, uh, from the, he could have had anybody defend his honor. Remember how all the people parted way in front of the Kaaba? Anybody would have come and defended him, but he uh, he fr he just ignored people who spoke to him harshly. One time, the ruler of Medina, uh, who uh, had oppressed or hurt Zain al Abidin, the ruler of Medina, the, he was harming the family of the Prophet Sallallahu or he harmed Zain al Abidin pers personally. So he, the, that ruler was fired from his position. He was fired from his position. So, and that means he was going to get in trouble. So Zain al Abidin went to him and he said, Ask from, you need any help, let me know. Even though he was harmed by this ruler, now that he was fired and he was going to get in trouble, Zain al Abidin says, Let me know if you need any help, I will, take, I will help you out. <laughs> so then that ruler, he said, Wallahu a'lamu haythu yaj'ana risalata. Actually, he read it, risalata. Allah knows where to put the messages. And subhanAllah, this is a qira'ah. When when in the science of qira'ah, the, you can say Allah knows where to put his message. That means Allah chose the prophets. Because those are the best of people. Allah didn't make a mistake. He chose these prophets because they're the best of people. Allah knows where to give his message. But this person, this ruler, he read the other qira'ah ah, where he said, Allah knows where to put the, his messages. And as if he's praising Zayn al Abidin, he said, Allah knows this family. Allah knows that this lineage was a very noble lineage, who was obedient to Allah. So he chose you to be righteous and to be from the family of the Prophet. So look at his forgiveness. Look at his overlooking. And this is something that our Muslim Ummah needs today. <clears throat> and we need to also inculcate these qualities of chivalry towards our children. Huh? Kids? We need, to, we need to, our children to learn these qualities. Our children, right, they're very much you know, uh, away from these qualities. So if we instill them in them when they're young, then when they become older, they will become deep rooted in their personalities insha'Allah ta'ala so he was humble uh, and Zuhri he said that Zain al Abidin he used to praise his worship he used to cry and cry out of fear of Allah and out of humility when he was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just showing off crying <laughs> he used to cry he was really fearful of Allah subhanAllah can you imagine that he had so much fear of Allah he used to cry. One time, 
they said that Zain al Abidin, the, the beauty of the worshippers, this is what Zain al Abidin means, Ali ibn Hussein, he was making sajda in his house and he was making a sajda for a long time, a very, very long time. And there was a fire that started nearby. The fire began to burn. So they came and they said, He's making such that there's a fire. There's a fire. Zain al Abidin, there's a fire. You have to get out of here. So he did not even pay attention. He didn't even realize what they were saying. Until after a while, the fire burned out and he came up from his sajda. And then he finished his prayer. So they said, Didn't you realize there was, we were telling you there's a fire? You could have been hurt. He said, The fire of the hereafter made me too busy to think about what you were saying. I was too deep in concentration. I was too much in khushua. And this is a quality of the Salaf. This is a true quality of the Salaf that, that we find many narrations like this. That when they were in ibadah, their presence of heart and their fear of Allah was so great that they forgot what is around them. SubhanAllah, may Allah help us to get closer to this state, inshaAllah. They used to worship Allah, they didn't even realize what's happening around them. This is the Salaf, you will find the predecessors, they had this quality. They didn't think about what is happening around them, they had what they call the Hudur. Hudur means presence of heart. And so this is what Zain al Abidin he said, I was so busy in my worship, in my sajda, thinking about the hellfire, that is awaiting the, belief, the, the disbelievers or the, pun, the punishment that is coming, I didn't even hear about, I didn't even hear anybody talking about a fire that is happening around us. It's concentration and uh, you know, focus of the heart. And this is a very beautiful quality, a very important quality. Um, <clears throat> Zain al-Abideen, um, Oh, actually, not Zain al-Abidin, another of the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He was, uh, he was a Sahabi, excuse me. The Sahabi, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he used to pray um, in the Haram, or nearby the Haram. He was in Mecca, and his neighbor's daughter used to watch him praying. Or she used to see him, you know, see him on his roof. And she thought that he was a, a pillar. <laughs> Because birds would come and land on him while he was praying. So in the morning time, she saw that that, that that thing that she saw at night was dark. She couldn't see what it was. But she said, Dad, that piece of wood that was there on the neighbor's roof is gone. What happened to that piece of wood that the birds were landing on? And then the father, he told his daughter, that wasn't a piece of wood. That was Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He was praying, standing so long in salah, the birds would come and land on him while, while he prayed. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zub, uh, excuse me, uh, Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn Hussein, he used to, uh, he used to work, uh, he used to have that khushua in his salah, which we need to try to attain. One of the salaf, he said, I fought my nafs 20 years. Kabatu nafsi asharina sana fi salah. I fought against my nafs for 20 years to get to be able to focus and stand up in prayer and 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 work and get up at night and pray i had to fight for 20 years and then he said i tasted the sweetness for 20 years he said kabattu nafsi asharina sana thumma taladhadtu asharina sana i fought my desires my whims for 20 years and then I tasted the sweetness for 20 years, subhanAllah. So this is the nature of the struggle against the nafs. That Zayn al-Abideen uh, is a good example of, of uh, purifying the nafs, inshaAllah ta'ala. One time Zayn al-Abideen was going towards Mecca for Hajj or Umrah. And it was time to begin the talbiyah because they put the ihram on. You know when you wear the ihram, if you're coming from Medina, where do you put on the ihram? Masjid of Medina? No. Masjid al Aisha is in Mecca, outside of Mecca. When they took uh, the Prophet sent Aisha there to put on, uh, to repeat her umrah, when she wanted to repeat it, to do another umrah, he sent her to that place. So that is the. Uh, 
you could say that's the hill, that, that's the place uh, where you can, for the people of Mecca. But what about if you're coming from Medina and you're on the way for Hajj or Umrah? Where do you, where's the miqat? Who knows the, it's called, today it's called Abyar Ali or it's called Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa. There's a masjid there. And it's very close to Medina. I think that maybe short time after you leave Medina, you come to the masjid called Dhul Hulayfa. And uh, in Dhul Hulayfa, they change and they get into their ihram. So Zain al Abidin, he was passing through the Miqat. He put on his ihram. And then they told him, it's time to make the talbiyah. Labbaik Allah. Here I am, O oh Allah, at your service. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. And he said, I'm afraid to say it. He said, why are you afraid to say it? He said, I'm afraid if I say it, Allah will say, La labbaik. Some hadith, they say that when a person says, La bik, they say, I'm here to, to at your service, O Allah. Allah responds to them if they're righteous. And Allah says, I am also accepting of you. But for some people, Allah says, La labbaik. Allah will say, I do not accept your labbaik. So Zain al Abidin, he said, I'm afraid to say La bik because maybe Allah will tell me, La labbaik. Look at how he looks at himself. He says, perhaps he, he's always questioning his nafs. That maybe Allah is not even going to accept this Umrah from me. Why, I'm afraid to say it. <laughs> so then his companions, they told him, they said, it's Sunnah, you have to say it. You have to say it because this is the Sunnah. And he, there's no choice here. You're following the Sunnah. So he said it and he fell off of his riding animal and he injured himself. He said, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. And then he, he got unconscious. He fell down and got injured. Because he was so much fear of Allah. So much khashya. Because he, when he reads the, the text that, that says, Allah will say, La Labbaik, it's real as if it's in front of his eyes. We read it and we just say, okay, yes. you know, uh, We have so many sins, but we don't think this is really going to happen. He's thinking to himself, this is really going to happen and it might be me. And so he had so much fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this, um, this example. Uh, he, he used to love knowledge. <clears throat> and he never stopped seeking knowledge until the end of his life. They narrated that he used to go to Zayd ibn Aslam. Remember Zayd ibn Aslam, is the, he's a freed slave. And he used to go to Zayd ibn Aslam to seek knowledge from him in the masjid. Uh, I believe this is in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu and he used to humble himself to his shaykh, subhanAllah. That's a beautiful characteristic. Um, <clears throat> Ubaidullah. Ubaidullah is one of the, also one of the scholars, one of the seven fuqaha of Medina, who is known for his knowledge and for his, uh, and, and also uh, Zain al Abidin used to seek knowledge uh, from him. And he used to say, Uh, no, okay, so what happened is Zain al Abidin, he came to Ubaid Allah to learn from him in Medina. And Ubaid Allah was praying a very long prayer. Very long prayer. And Zain al Abidin was staying humbly sitting there waiting. So when Ubaid Allah finished his prayer, the people told him, they said, You know that Zain al Abidin was waiting for you. And he stayed this whole time waiting for you, and you were praying long, making him wait. So Ubaid Allah, he said, Anybody who wants knowledge should find it a little bit hard. <laughs> if you want knowledge, don't make it easy. Make it a little bit hard for, so that they deserve it. Right? So he said, I did that on purpose. Uh, you know, he, he said it was intended to make people wait sometimes. Sometimes, right? This is the wisdom of our ulama, that when they want to raise somebody. See, the ulama, they don't just, you know, give knowledge for nothing. I mean, they don't just force people to learn the knowledge. He said, if you want to raise somebody's character, he says, make them work for that knowledge a little bit so they feel the value of it. So he said, I wanted him, anybody who wants knowledge, he should work hard for it. So I made him to wait. Omar, radiallahu anhu, Omar, he used to say, ta'allamu qabla an, or he used to say, tafaqahu qabla an tasudu. It's a very beautiful statement. I learned it from my sheikh in Syria. I hope all of you can benefit from the statement that Omar said, learn the fiqh before you lead. 
تعلموا أو تفقهوا قبل أن تسود تفقهوا قبل أن تسودوا What does it mean? Learn the fiqh before you become a leader Why? Why did Umar say learn the fiqh before you become a leader? A ruler? Or a leader in any position of leadership? Okay, the, the maybe, but <clears throat> you can take mashura from the scholars, right, as a leader. But when you become a leader, a ruler, you don't you become very busy, right? So you, when you're very busy as a ruler, you don't have time to seek knowledge, which is why many of the Khulafa Rashidin, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, we don't have too many hadith from them, even though uh, full agreement they are the most virtuous of the Sahaba, but they were busy with the Khilafa and other things. So learning before we become in a position of leadership, because once you're in a position of leadership, you'll be very busy. You may not find time to go and sit under the scholars and learn. So get that knowledge before you become in that position of leadership. Second of all, they say that Umar, what Omar meant, learn before you become a leader. Because once you're in a leadership position, sometimes people become arrogant. And as a leader, they don't want to sit and learn under somebody. So they, they, they will feel like it's below them to go and learn from a teacher. So learn that knowledge before they become put in that position where they will feel like it is below them to seek knowledge. Az-Zuhri, he was of course the great scholar of hadith. And he, um, he narrated a hadith to Zain al-Abidin. Zain al-Abidin said, I heard this hadith. Uh, I have this hadith already. So Zuhri, he said to him, everything I know, you already know it. <laughs> Every, there's no knowledge that I have that you don't have. So Zain al-Abidin, he said, no, don't think this way. Make the knowledge widespread. Don't keep it a secret. Keep talking about it. Keep spreading it. It's not a secret. This knowledge should be repeated. Even if you heard it already, let's hear it again. And so he didn't want to be stingy with the knowledge. He said, let every, repeat it and keep transmitting it. I'll, even if I heard it, I will learn it again. Because he said, knowledge will not be, uh, knowledge should not be confined. It should be repeated on the tongues of people. And this shows you that knowledge should never be hidden from people. And this goes against who? The Baltaniya. The Baltaniya, the Fatimids, they were a, a Shiite sect. What they used to do is they believed that there were secret meanings of the Qur'an. Hidden meanings that only the very elite people had the knowledge of those hidden meanings. So they said that the only way you can get this knowledge is that you become a murid under that tariqah. You cannot get this knowledge from learning from a shaykh. You have to go into the tariqah and then you will achieve that knowledge. So <clears throat> what happened? Uh, this is not correct. This has actually caused the downfall of Islam. It prevented the spread of knowledge. It, people began to say, we cannot spread knowledge in halaqahs. We have to go into this, the khanaqah, the special place, sit under the shaykh for 10, 20 years, you'll get that special knowledge. This is not what Zain al-Abidin was saying. He said, keep spreading the knowledge. If people heard it, let them hear it again, so they may benefit from it. He was so patient. This is another thing we learned from him. I'm almost finished here. Um, he was so patient when his family was killed. Remember, he kept patient and he kept sabr with the, uh, the rulers and the wrong that they did. Um, and he used to pray behind the rulers. One time, very interesting story, I hope that everyone can catch and understand the story. Zain al Abidin was praying behind their Imam. The Imam was from the Umayyads. And, and so Zain al-Abidin is praying and he heard a group of people gathering near him started talking during the Salah. So then he turned after the prayer, he said, who are these people that are talking during the Salah? They said, they are your Shia. They are your supporters. These are the Shiites. They came here to support you. And he said, no, this is an innovation. He said, we pray behind anybody who reads our Quran and faces our Qibla. If he's righteous or evil, this is the way of our methodology. And he said, these people, they were talking during prayer because they weren't really praying. 
they were doing taqiyah. They were pretending they were praying with that imam because they don't want to get in trouble. But actually they were chatting because they, they want to show we're not really following this imam. We're trying to do taqiyah. So they said, we are your supporters. Zain al-Abidin, we're here to support you. We're Shia. So Zain al-Abidin, what did he tell them? <clears throat> and this is an imam from the imams that they respect, right? What do they call them? The 12 imams, right? And we're gonna, maybe next week we'll talk about this, this concept of 12 imams and the isma. But they respect Zain al-Abidin and he told them this is innovation. Taqiyah is innovation. We pray behind the Imam, whether he's righteous or not righteous, provided that he faces our Qibla and reads our Quran. Why? Because it will lead to great fitna and dissension. If we rebel against our, the Imam and we, we don't pray behind the unrighteous Imams, it will divide the Ummah, it will create fighting, it will create civil war, it will create killing, it will create spilling of blood, it will create destruction and disunity and fitna, which will bring the enemies to destroy Islam. So he knew that. Look at this pious person saying that. And then he said, one time he was in a halaqa and he heard some screams. He heard some screams from the house like somebody had passed away. And he went and to see what the screaming was and he came back. And then when he came back, the people asked if somebody passed away and they started offering the condolences. And he said, Sabrun Jameel. We are pleased with whatever Allah does. It shows you again his sabr. Sabrun Jameel, what is Sabrun Jameel? What's the difference between sabr and Sabrun Jameel? Sabr means you don't get angry. But somebody might complain. Sabrun Jameel is when somebody, they, something happens to them, they keep patient and they don't complain. Like who did that? Yaqub alayhi salam. Sabrun Jameel. He didn't complain to anybody. He only complained to Allah. Complaining to Allah is not impatience. We can complain to Allah. Allah loves to hear the complaints. Shakwa. Complaining means that you you tell your state to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am weak. I am I'm in need of you. I am, uh, I am in a difficult circumstances. So you're complaining to Allah about your situation. <coughs> We still have uh, a few more pages, so we'll stop here. It's 9.15, is the salah, right? Yeah. So we'll stop here, and if it's okay, do you want to continue after Isha? Ah. Some, if you get time, please uh, say some, uh, something about Yahoo Imagine. Inshallah, after the salah, <laughs> inshallah. Yes. This is a big topic. Yes. Here come, you want to improve the work. Yes. And then, and then you go to the space. Uh, but nobody found Inshallah, after the sunnah, after the sunnah, we'll pray salah and pray sunnah, and then we'll have a short talk. Inshallah, we'll try to answer all your questions. Jazakum Allah khair wa sallallahu alaihi Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi sallam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi salam. Welcome back, inshallah, we just finished up our lesson on the great hero of Islam, Zain al-Abidin, inshallah. And then we have a question from the brothers, inshallah. Zain al-Abidin, <coughs> as we mentioned, he was the great grandson of the Prophet sallallahu His father was Hussein. And... Abu Hazm, he said, I've never seen a faqih greater than him. He had such a deep fiqh, deep understanding. And so one thing I want to really, this is a beautiful quote if we can understand this. They asked Zain al-Abidin, who is the son of Hussein, Ali ibn Hussein. They asked him, what do you say about the two sheikhs? <laughs> who are the two sheikhs? Abu Bakr and Umar. So they wanted to find out, what do you think about Abu Bakr and Umar? What is their position? What is their position in the hereafter? Because you see some people, they thought maybe he's from the family of the Prophet He doesn't like, he doesn't like uh, Abu Bakr and Umar, right? They think that. So what, look at his fiqh. He said, <coughs> Zain al-Abidin, he said, their position, with the, is, their position in the hereafter is with the Prophet wasallam, just like their position is right now. He said, go look where their position is. 
So the Prophet is buried there. Abu Bakr is just a few feet away from him. And then Umar is just a few feet away from him. So he said, if you want to know where they are, just look at them right now. They're right next to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, that is their position in the hereafter. Look at his fiqh. Look at his deep understanding. He gave an answer that nobody can deny, subhanAllah. And this also shows you from the Imams that... Yes, yes, they're from the Ashul Mubashirin. Look at, but it shows you the Imams that the Shia had put false narrations towards those Imams. It shows you that in fact those Imams loved Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. And in fact, you find that many, many hadith says the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar. The Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, they went out. The Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, they went to this place. So it shows you that what Zain al Abidin had said about them is actually a very great uh, and deep fiqhi point that we hope that the Shias, may Allah guide them and us, understand this point, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> Mukhtar. There was a person named Mukhtar. He claimed that he was a prophet, but he used to praise the Ahlul Bayt. So they asked Zain al Abidin, "What do you say about this guy, Mukhtar?" So he he took hold of the door of the Kaaba and he said, "I swear that they he is cursed because he claimed that he was a prophet, even though this person Mukhtar used to claim or praise the family of the Prophet so This shows you his justice, even though he's from the family of the Prophet so and Mukhtar is praising him. He said, I, pray, I swear that this person is a cursed liar. Because he said he's a prophet. So you see again his justice in his uprightness. The people, um, they, we find in Zain al Abidin the patience, he was Zahid, his khuluq. And the Sunnis praise him. See, one of the falsehoods out there is that they say that the Sunnis are against the Imams of the Shia. They, they call them their Imams, but they're actually our Imams. Ali is our Imam, Hussein is our Imam, Zain al Abidin is our Imam, and as we'll see, his son and his grandson, his son Muhammad al Baqir and Jafar al Sadiq, these are all from his lineage. We all love them. So, this is a, not true that the Sunnis don't respect these Imams, but some of the sayings they said from those Imams are not true. Those Imams did not criticize or go against the uh, Khulafa al-Rashidin, inshaAllah. This, the, one more thing about him, uh, one of the things we can learn from him, is that he had a golden chain. And he, his chain of hadith is considered the most authentic, the one that he narrates from his father Hussein, from Ali, from the Prophet Wasallam. It's one of the golden chains. And again, like we said, it's found in all six books. Bukhari Muslim. Bukhari accepted from him. So it shows you his great status with uh, the muhaddithin and that he was uh, he was one of the great ulama of the time. However, he didn't narrate that many hadith and they say this is because of his fear of Allah. He was afraid that he would, he, he was so scared that he would say something wrong on the tongue of the Prophet So you find that some people, they were very devout worshippers, they didn't narrate that much knowledge. Um, so, to conclude about Zain al Abidin is that he was a great worshipper, but he was also a faqih and a scholar. And what our ulama say is that spreading knowledge is greater than worship. Spreading knowledge, it has a higher status than worship. Even some of the imams, uh, they said that s spreading knowledge is a, is a greater than the jihad fi sabilillah. If somebody were to go and die, for in the righteous cause of Islam, spreading knowledge is even higher than that. This is the words of Yahya ibn Mu'im. Yahya ibn Mu'im is one of the teachers of Imam al-Bukhari, a great muhaddith. And he says that this is that seeking knowledge or spreading knowledge is greater than jihad fi sabilillah. This is because the scholar protects the sunnah. This is what he said. He said that, they, they asked him, they said, how can this be that spreading knowledge is greater than jihad? He said, how else will the sunnah be preserved? So preserving the sunnah has a higher status. This is the, the role of the ulama. And also spreading knowledge takes priority over ibadah in the time of ignorance. People are very ignorant. It's better for people to spread knowledge than to spend time doing ibadah. This is when you have a contradiction. But if you can do both, this is better. If you can worship, 
and teach. You can worship, seek knowledge. This is excellent. But if you find there's a contradiction, then seeking knowledge and spreading knowledge has a higher status. And also the, the scholars say that look at what Allah helps you to do. You know, if you find yourself, I want to, you know, I want to do some act of worship. Should I read Quran? Should I pray Qiyam al -Layn? Should I make dua? Should I do dhikr? Should I go to the class of knowledge? If you find that your, your, your soul is being, you know, you find that you love seeking knowledge, then you should make this the goal of your life. Because being steadfast in one type of thing is virtuous. If you keep jumping, say, I'm going to be an Abid, I'm going to worship one year. Then I'm, I'm going to seek knowledge. Now I'm going to go do, I'm going to go for Hajj every year. Now I'm going to go and, uh, you know, uh, help the poor. And so you try to do everything, you will never accomplish anything. Right? So the ulama say, choose something that you find, you are inclined to, that you feel an inclination towards, and then go after it specialize in it and 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 become uh, you know uh, devoted to it because they say istiqama ayn al karama istiqama means staying steadfast on something good it is the greatest honor you know flipping back and forth doing one thing then another then another is not going to achieve the goal we want uh, what what the what is needed is people who specialize and who master and perfect the, the Islamic sciences, insha'Allah ta'ala. So this brings us to the close of the life of Zain al-Abideen, rahimahullah. He lived a very fruitful life, a, a life of worship and knowledge. And he lived about 60 years old. Uh, again, he was born in 30, uh, I believe 33 after Hijrah. There's different opinions about the date of his birth. The son of Ali, I'm sorry, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali, the son of uh, Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with all of them and may Allah guide us to follow in their footsteps and to have that beautiful worship that they had inshallah ta'ala. Alright, so we have some maybe a couple time for a couple questions. Inshallah. The one question the brother had asked before the um, before the salah. Before we go to his question, any questions about the life of Zain al Abidin? Ali ibn Hussein. Because this question is a little bit of a different topic. Anybody have any? No. Okay, if you think of one, you can still bring it up, inshallah. The brother's question was about who? The Juj and Majuj. So the Juj and Majuj, <coughs> they're mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith. And in the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Al Kahf. When the great, mighty king, the righteous Muslim king, Dhul Qarnayn, he came to the people when he was traveling the earth and establishing justice he came to a people and he said in the juj wa majuj la fil ar indeed the juj and majuj are making evil on the earth so make for us a barrier that will keep their evil away from us so then he told me give me some lead and give me some iron and he said blow the fire on it and then he built a fire that the Juj and Majuj could not get over. They try to climb it, but then Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي When the promise of Allah comes, they will break the barrier. And they will come out and they will spread throughout the earth. So this is mentioned in the Quran. And the Juj and Majuj in many hadith, they are human beings. They're not a different kind of creature like we had earlier, like a mouse or something, no. <laughs> They're human beings, Bunny Adam. And the Prophet he, he was told that uh, on the Day of Judgment, the people will be brought in the hellfire, and out of 900, out of 1,000, 999 will go in the hellfire. So then he became very worried. And he said, what about my ummah? So then the, the, he was told, the angel told him, that the 999 will be from the Juj and Majuj. And the one who goes into the Jannah will be from your Ummah. So a huge number. They have a large number. And they travel on the earth and they destroy the resources of the earth. And they spread evil and corruption. Until Isa ibn Maryam prays against them. And when he prays against them, then Allah will send a disease to destroy them. Until their bodies will fill the earth and the believers will go up high with Isa ibn Maryam, they'll go up on a mountain or on a hill or somewhere up 
until the earth is cleansed from their bodies, then they will come back down after that. So this is what we know in the authentic sunnah, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah knows best. Any other questions? I have a book here I want to share with everybody. It's called The Eastern Origins of the Western Civilization. I came across this book today. It was fascinating to see this. And the author here, his name is John M. Hobson. And he says that the entire Western civilization came from Islam and came from the East. He also talks about China, but he says this Western civilization, it is based on the Islamic knowledge. He said that they, they wouldn't even have been able to come to North America unless they had the astrolabe, which is, it, they use the stars to find the direction, and a, a special kind of sail. They had a special kind of sail that they used to travel the huge oceans. That was developed by the Muslims. So he says that the Western civilization, civilization is based on Islamic knowledge. And what's even more interesting, if you go to uh, the chapter here about Christianity, he says right here, page 107, inventing Christendom. And he says, inventing the identity of Christendom in a global context. And then his title is, constructing or inventing the Islamic threat. All right, and now what does he say here? He says that Europe, they did not have one unified identity. They were divided, many cultures, many languages, even the religion, Christianity was divided into hundreds of sects, right? or we know 72 sects. So he said that they, the Europeans needed to come up with a way to create their own identity. And the only way to do that was to create an enemy so that everyone will be opposed to that enemy and that will bring them together and they will define their identity as being opposed to that enemy. He's not talking about 21st century. He's talking about from the times of the Crusades onwards. And he's saying that Europe had to create an enemy in order to create an identity for itself. And so he said they had to create an Islamic threat. And what did they do? What is the best threat? They said that Islam is a pagan moon-worshipping religion. And Prophet Muhammad Astaghfirullah, is a lying, a liar, and so on and so on. So they created this false threat. This is non-Muslim, by the way. John Hobson is a professor. He's writing this and saying that the Europeans created a false enemy in Islam in order to create their own unity, because they didn't have any unity. And that's the easiest way to get people to come together if you say that you're going to be attacked by an enemy. So he created, he says they created the Islamic uh, threat. And he says, uh, he says the, 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 the Christian rulers, Islam had not constructed just as evil, but also as a threat so the Europeans could unite against it. The Muslims were a threat to Western Christendom long before they even thought about them being a problem. SubhanAllah. So I just wanted to share this because I think this is very powerful. If we understand people are saying that Muslims are against the West, Muslims are foreign to the West. We are not foreign to the West. We are the West. The civilization today, the Eastern origins of Western civilization. This civilization today that we live in would not exist if it wasn't for Islam. And this is proven right here by non-Muslims. So we're not foreigners. This is our country, our civilization. We uh, helped to discover this land and we helped to develop the sciences that brought about this Western civilization. So we are, proud, we are part of it, inshallah. And we should not allow people to turn us into this enemy so that they can you know, use us as a, a um, third column, as they say. To, to go against Muslims. Alhamdulillah, we are, um, you know, alhamdulillah, very, very proud of our contributions to Western society, inshallah. So, Jazakumullah khair, I kept you very long. I'm sorry about that. Jazakumullah khair and subhanakallah, bihamdik, astaghfirullah wa And before you go, say salam to five people, inshallah. That's how we get benefit from these gatherings, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Come on.